On va commencer bientôt, dans à peu près cinq minutes maximum. We'll be starting in about five minutes. Yes, and you can also use the... On va reprendre très bientôt. We'll start shortly.
Thank you. I would ask you to take your seats as we want to start shortly. So welcome back. Uh, and I thank you for, uh, as I was thinking during the break, democracy has spoken. So <laughs> thank you. And I promise I will not make the same offer in the afternoon. I promise. So we are very excited for, to host this next panel, which will explore how the GLAM sector can work more closely with indigenous communities to preserve and promote indigenous culture and heritage. Uh, the panelists will make a brief presentation followed by a conversation and questions for, from the audience for the last 10 minutes or so. Il nous fait plaisir d'accueillir Monsieur André Dudemaine, fondateur et directeur de Terre. It's a pleasure for us to welcome André Dudemain, the founder of Directeur des Terres, um, and he is uh, also going to be responsible for a festival about the Aboriginal presence in Montreal. He has certainly contributed to the recognition and promotion of the Aboriginal cultures of North America. and. Uh, he is going to be with Mr. Louis Gagnon, who is uh, the curator and director of the uh, director of Oma Glivich, and he's the secretariat of the arts of Nunavik, and he has been working throughout the world. And during this last uh, 40 years, he has uh, looked at different facets of the art and culture of the Inuits of Nunavik, and he is being also working with Olivia Lea Tomasis, who is the Secretary of the Art of Mama Glicic at the Cultural Institute of Avatak. She is uh, from uh, Kangersuk in Nunavik, and she was participated in the youth of Aboriginal Montreal, and she also started with the uh, International Festival last March as well the film on art. And finally, we have Karen Schmon, who is the director of the Department of Culture and Heritage at the Institute of Aboriginal Studies. And she has spent all her life as an educator on human justice and human rights. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Well, uh, we know we always uh, lack physical exercise during those uh, events, so we thought to have a real Canadian exercise. The panel here will be bilingual, so you will have to take on and take off your earphones. That will uh, help your uh, help. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's go into the, the subject. I, uh, we have uh, two different uh, institutes, Gabriel Dumont Institute and Avatak Cultural Institute. Very different and in some cases similar organizations. So uh, maybe I will ask first to uh, Karen to present uh, what is the uh, Gabriel Dumont Institute? Here. Yep. The Gabriel Dumont Institute is a, uh, a Métis-focused post-secondary education and cultural organization based in Saskatchewan. We serve the needs of the Métis of the province of Saskatchewan. We have um, the design and delivery of uh, programs and services for Métis people so that they can get the skills for employment. And we have uh, everything from adult upgrading to post-secondary. One of the flagship programs is uh, Métis teacher education. On the cultural side, we have a museum, a gallery, special collections, and, um, and archives. And we have the world's largest repository of Métis-specific items um, free and accessible on the World Wide Web with our virtual museum of Métis history and culture. And that's the department that I work in. And uh, we make a lot of resources since the inception of the Institute in 1980. We have published over 200 resources. 
Can you give uh, us a small idea of the archives you have? Um, well, it's all, it's all Métis focused, so it would be um, everything from uh, photographs to um, documents, uh, videos. Uh, we have been, uh, in those 40 years, making the archives ourselves by um, videotaping, uh, audio recording, and collecting um, anything that's Métis specific. This is, to us, has been something that's been missing out of um, a lot of archives, and so um, we look to fill that gap by doing so. Ok, thank you. Now, I don't know, uh, je sais pas lequel des, des deux voudrait commencer. Or... Now, I don't know which of you two would like to start now to present the Avatac Cultural Center. I'm here with Louis Gagnon, who is actually my boss. First, I'd like to tell you about our uh, Avatar Cultural Center, which was created following the negotiations of uh, Bay James uh, and the North of Quebec in the 70s. And these were negotiations for to give Nunavik more independence so that they would actually be independent and would manage their own affairs. And then they realized after a few years that culture was disappearing because of our modern era and changes in our uh, era. So they decided that they had to protect it. So Avatar is uh, something that you attach to safeguard in case of uh, water currents. So it's a metaphor, therefore, for things that are disappearing and that you want to hold on to. There is also the archaeology, genealogy, archives. And I am in Ahmad Vivik, where the secretariat is. And I am also responsible for programs. It means that we provide support and promotion for the artists of Nunavik. Our secretariat has all the information about the artists, but only, of course, upon their cons consent. And if they ask for any kind of subsidies or grants, then they send us their work and their uh, in MP3 form, MP4, video, music, or uh, copies of their art. And this information is very precious for you because we actually keep two copies of all of this material that they send us so that we can have one in our archives. And we will have, therefore, files on all the artists. For those who don't have a bio or a CV, my job has to do with helping them to develop one, of course, with their consent again and their approval to make sure that everything is authentic and true. So it's up to us, the employees, to understand what they're doing in Nunavik and exactly what their actions are. And we can use them also for projects. This year we have a Pakitamak project where it is a website where we promote the artists of Nunavik for the International UNESCO Year of Aboriginal Languages. And we can also receive requests for grants for different festivals that look for Aboriginal artists. And therefore, we can provide all of this support material uh, to promote our artists at that point. Sometimes we also have some uh, exhibits or expositions or in Iriavut. Elia Wood is going to be doing a tour with different artists from different communities from Nunavik. They've created, therefore, this tour. This is an example. There is Ololimut, which is uh, which is about Matthew Sieltuk and Lucas Siarnouk. And we have many on our internet site that you'll be able to look up if you want to. And there you see there Tunivut, Inutunavugut. And that's it. Those are the publications. What are they? <laughs> Sorry, that was not audible, actually. She didn't speak in the mic. 
All right. Thank you very much, Olivia. Very kind of you. And thank you for inviting us to this uh, conference and to this uh, panel so that we can talk about Avatac and what we do. Now, Olivia gave you an introduction to our institute. But I want to mention these are publications. And this is perhaps our most important publication that has to do with our cultural magazine. It's called Sur la Trace de nos Pas. And it exists because of the archives that we have in our Cultural Institute of Avatac. So everything's based on the archives. And we sh make sure that the material that's in our archives is actually accessible through this magazine. And one of these magazines is distributed to every household in Nunavik. And there are a, you can also get examples of this if you uh, write to us, but really it's dedicated to the Nunavut population. And you mentioned also that we have this whole publication department because it is because of these publications that we can produce such material. This is actually a photo album of the Sagawit uh, community and with the collaboration of Potosik Dinututu, who is an author and somebody who does radio work in that community. He has developed an uh, expertise to do interviews with the aging population, and therefore he has produced this publication on his own community. And it's really become an amazing piece of work because it's all uh, full of history, full of pictures. And we know, of course, that we've had always an oral tradition up to now in the Inuit culture. But now we are beginning to publish these and therefore document everything. So I wanted to tell, if you don't mind, can I continue? Well, at our institute, our cultural institute, we have a museum which represents uh, a place where we are accumulating a number of art objects and artworks and objects. And we have a collection that has tripled over the last 10 years. So we're making a very big effort to collect these objects. But you should explain also that the creation of uh, the Inuit sculpture, the artists who created that sculpture, that you have the biggest collection that you have actually preserved there. Yes, yes. It's important that you should understand that we are the curators, indeed, of one of the biggest uh, collection of uh, sculpture works. But the idea is that all of this has to reach our community. We are accumulating all these objects, but the idea is that we want to make everything accessible to our population. Because in our communities, if you've been to Nunavik, you'll realize very quickly that, unfortunately, there is a lot of material heritage that's not there. Very few people have seen real kayaks. Very people have actually experienced many of the objects that we have kept now and that we have been collecting and that they're surprised to see. So what we are collecting there are objects that we have found in the south and that we're bringing back to the north. We brought a kayak, for example. We collaborated with the university here in Montreal to be able to get that kayak back up into the north. And so it's a, there's a real interest in returning all these objects where they belong. And I think that there's also a collection uh, on which we're doing some reverse archaeology. We have a collection that we received, and people wanted to know more about this collection. Pour faire des entrevues localement. We hired someone to actually reconstruct that collection. How did it come about? And we rebuilt the whole pathway. And now that collection has gone back to its original spot and is accessible to the population. There are many other similar projects that we have initiated in our museum. Well, we'll get back to many to, to all this. Let me, let me just uh, interrupt you here. Experiences to share where uh, community and uh, archives has been uh, connected through uh, creative projects. 
there, the uh, Métis and Saskatchewan, the southwest part of the province of Saskatchewan, we're pretty much uh, pushed out of that area. Um, the uh, um, Métis were not recognized in the Constitution until 1982. So the lands they were occupying uh, were um, taken over by the government and given to settlers. And then they, um, the hostility in the area caused them to move away to other areas. I'm going to say pushed away. So there was a history of the Métis in the southwest part of the province, but very few people knew of that history. And so we worked with the Swift Current um, Art Gallery, which is a um, in the southwest part of the province, to um, uh, capture that history. And we collaborated by hiring an artist that um, went out and did interviews with local people to find out um, where were the Métis here. What, uh, where did they live? Um, what did they do? How were they contributing to the development of this area of the province? And then he depicted it in uh, images. And then that uh, show and story was up in the Swift Current area. And then it traveled throughout the, the region. I think for over two years it was traveling to different smaller communities so that people could see and know more about the Métis in that area of the province. So that was one of our successes. I think I will leave uh, for a moment my role of uh, moderator. Uh, un exemple bien précis à donner. I have an example also to provide of something that we did right here in this library. About uh, 10 years ago, we had a collection of uh, ancient pictures that showed the traditional life of the Inuit when they were nomads on this territory. And the library here decided to contact them and say, look, we want to show this. And what we proposed was to talk to Josephine Bacon, who is an Inuit poet, so that she can make a commentary on these photographs so that we can make an exhibit of them. And people were so seduced by the poetry of uh, Josephine's texts that we added even sound to the exhibit so that people could hear in Inuit and in French her comments. And it was called Nachinanu, and we inaugurated that with Aboriginal people, uh, with the festival in Montreal, and this exhibit is now actually still around. And Josephine Bacon was so happy with this experience that she has since actually published poetry books and that now she goes to all the book shows around the world. So as you can see, this had wonderful uh, consequences and um, results. Now, I know you wanted to talk about something again. What was it? Yes, an experience that we are going through right now. It goes beyond what you see normally. Because for the first time in Nunavut, we have decided to actually um, refurbish a historical building. And we've looked in the archives. We've done a lot of work to make sure that this is actually, this building is restored as it was. And we saw that we had the memoirs of Reverend Pick, who was the first Anglican who used that church, that building. And I thought it was relevant that the population should learn in Kujuarapit, which is one of the villages that is in the south of Nunavik, to publish these memoirs to give access, actually, to the population at, of Kujuarapi in particular because we are redefining the role of this building within the community. People have always considered it actually a temple. And with the fact that Reverend Pick had an important impact on the promotion of the Anglican Church in Nunavik, people actually came from all over the province to get baptized there or to assist uh, weddings there and so on. So there was a, a very big impact. And now we have to work with the population, the local population. So we have 
local cultural committees and the one in Kujua Rapid is actually looking at this issue to see how it can bring back the past and uh, promote it within the community. How are they going to be able to do this? It's a real outreach to the community with this information and what we have realized is that this Anglican church is going, therefore, to become a bridge and a cultural center, and it's going to be one of the poles of that community. There's also a cultural center there. We want to create links, physical links, in fact, between those two buildings, between the church and the cultural center that's next to it. And maybe we can start re-celebrating baptismals in that church and reach out to the needs of the community so that it's not a monolithic uh, building. So it would be interesting to see what they do in Manitoba. No, it's in Saskatchewan, isn't it? <laughs> Faites-vous le retour de l'information que vous avez dans vos archives euh, vers la communauté à l'extérieur de votre centre? Oui. Nous avons euh, rénové la seule maison qui reste sur euh, le site historique de Bataille, là où les Métis ont eu la bataille en 1885 qu'on appelle la résistance de 1885. Là, je m'entends en français. Pourquoi cette personne n'a cette... arrêté de pas de parler? Alors, cette maison ça a été rénovée. Les dernières personnes qui ont habité, c'était la famille Caron. Et bien sûr, l'ancêtre faisait partie de la résistance de 1885. La dernière fois qu'ils ont habité, c'était dans les années 50. C'est une de ces vieilles fermes avec une partie centrale. On a reconstruit telle que la maison paraissait en 1885. On a refait euh, la cuisine à euh, la mode des années 50. Et nous avons créé un album numérique qui montrait toutes les photos de familles de la période. Et les interprètes de Parc Canada racontent l'histoire de la famille Caron. C'est un des... À l'extérieur, ils ont un jardin, un poulailler, puis des personnes habillées dans des costumes d'époque et qui se comportent comme la famille l'aurait fait à l'époque. Une des choses que les enfants aiment bien faire, c'est de se servir d'une pompe, une vieille pompe, tout simplement un seau en dessous d'une... De, de stand en bois parce qu'il n'y a pas de puits réellement. Alors, les enfants aiment bien faire cela. C'est une façon de re retourner les choses à la communauté. Et je vais vous inviter, là, ceux qui restent à Montréal pour quelques jours, à aller visiter le musée McCord, parce qu'ils ont ce type de coopération ici à Montréal entre artistes et collections d'archives. Et présentement, Anna Klaus a une exposition qui est vraiment très belle. Anna Klaus est une artiste qui vient à Montréal. Maintenant, j'aimerais vous demander quel est votre projet de rêve. Qu'est-ce que vous espérez faire qui, qui marche à la perfection? In our department, uh, with my colleague Louis, we hope to visit as many villages as possible in Nunavut and meet artists. Not everyone is doing a bit is aware or at Megavik of the services we offer. A few are, but not everybody. So what we'd like to do is visit uh, Nunavut and see what's being done elsewhere. Do they work in a safe environment? Because it's a bit difficult. It's not always uh, easy to contact people in Nunavut from Montreal. In the communities, it's easy. You simply go to a person's house. You don't need to knock on the door. Here in Montreal, it's more difficult. They might not have email or phone or Facebook. 
say, what can I do? Well, I have to phone the community radio to make an announcement saying I would like that person to phone me at Avatak. I'm more from the Ungava Bay area, but I've also, and the Ungava Bay is quite different from Hudson's Bay. It's very diversified in terms of all arts. We support all types of artistic endeavor. And it's interesting to see the evolution and the specificities of each community. And we like to identify exactly what's more common between one community and another. Excluded, and um, I like the acronym there because a, a mole is a, a spy. And uh, if you can think of that as uh, something to remind you, where are Indigenous peoples misrepresented, omitted, left out, or excluded? I'm on the advisory committee to Library and Archives Canada for um, uh, Indigenous Advisory Committee. And uh, I believe that um, this is an example of um, building that trust and relationship with the committee members and uh, where um, Indigenous peoples have been misrepresented. There's a real um, earnest desire there to um, correct those things, but to leave in the original caption so that people understand what were their perspectives uh, at the time that they were made. I've said this one here, that truth has to come before reconciliation and that uh, reconciliation is a process, not an event, and it took a long time for us to get to the point where we knew we needed it, so it will take a long time until it's achieved. Uh, I encourage everyone to learn from Indigenous peoples and to learn about us. Uh, indigenous knowledge is of value to everyone, and so that, I think, has been a missing element and that it's had any value or worth. And we can uh, see from uh, the uh, TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, what happened in res residential schools was that uh, there was an overt uh, message that your, your knowledge is not of any value, your language is not of any value. And so we, we would like um, that to change, and um, I think it's... Uh, it's for everyone. It started out we were affirming ourselves and now we want to inform the others as well. Um, I, I think that I was quite um, uh, gobsmacked actually by the keynote presentation. She did a fabulous job. And I think in uh, uh, many ways she's made uh, uh, Glam's family friendly in, in a lot of the things that, that uh, she has been doing. 
With Indigenous peoples, uh, uh, they, they go to things as families. They go to things in, in groups, and a lot of times um, there may not be childcare available. So when you make it family friendly, um, you're looking at an intergenerational approach to engaging Indigenous peoples. Um, I would encourage you to work to make children feel that GLAMS exist to enrich their lives. Um, as when, when I was a classroom teacher, I always tried to take uh, uh, my students out to galleries, libraries, archives, and museums because I think that they, as they, if they don't get, gain that appreciation as youth, how would you expect them to have it as adults? And um, I, I see a very, uh, what I call a, a frightening and disturbing model of, um, you know, business as usual or open for business in which um, only the business case for anything it has any value and not necessarily the aesthetic value of, of uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, we have good examples here of taking what you have to offer to the community in partnership with the community. And so we heard that from uh, some of the, the first panel as well. And um, at least in the case of Indigenous peoples, because of many of our folks are uh, in remote uh, northern or rural communities who don't get to cities to see um, uh, you know, what you have, and that's a shame. But if you can um, loan it out or take it out or even share it digitally um, outwards, I think that that's going to be a reciprocal benefit for you and that they will start contributing um, what they have uh, to your organization and allowing uh, you to use it mutually. Um, we also, um, I think in the first panel, had a good example of evaluating your performance, and this is to see where you can do things differently or do them uh, better, and also to take the risks, be prepared to fail because you can't uh, know what works until you find out what doesn't work, and so not everything will be a success, and uh, it should, nor should it be expected that you have 100% success. Uh, capacity and tenacity. I put these two words down here because really right now all of the mainstream um, uh, galleries, libraries, archives and museums have the capacity. You not only have the holdings, but you have the expertise and years and years of experience that you can share and mentor Indigenous groups so that they can um, either make their own or be part of yours or have a reciprocal relationship with you. It's um, took you a long time to garner that experience and expertise, and so um, mentoring it and building it up in others is going to be very helpful. In, in the workplace, like if you're going to have a representative workforce that includes Indigenous peoples, um, a lot of times you, you need to take somebody under your wing. We, we work uh, really effectively under a, a mentor, and that um, could be everything from what's your workplace culture to um, how do you fill out forms, et cetera, and all of that, but also to um, just build capacity in that person. The mark of a good leader is someone that, who does such a good job that uh, when they leave, the, the other people don't even notice that they're gone. And then tenacity is you're going to have some skepticism, backlash, and uh, some uh, failures, but um, I mean, those are to be expected when you look at what's the history of um, Indigenous people either being ignored or when they are um, engaged, it's usually to, uh, this sounds going to sound really bad, is to make the uh, mainstream place look better. There we had our engagement, so we can check that box off. So be tenacious because if you um, fail to engage um, Indigenous peoples because of that skepticism or the, the legacy of past failures that they've experienced, just keep trying because Working successfully with Indigenous peoples is about building relationship, and um, that, that takes time, too. Um, I think it's really important that you uh, continue to believe that this is the right thing to do and that you can do it. Um, there, I, I know um, you just have to read uh, some of the comments that used to be on CBC when it was around Indigenous issues to the point where they had to disable them because some of them were so... Um, Races, so I think that um, you know it's going to be hard for uh, non-Indigenous Canadians to get their head around this. But if you um, start to believe that this is the right thing to do, and if you uh, you know maintain that belief, I know that that you can help us succeed and become um, the 
I guess the, the full partner in Canada that uh, we are. We have lots to celebrate about having such a great country and all of these wonderful holdings. And uh, it's time that um, we got to step up and share that with, with the rest of Canada. Uh, I guess I will uh, end by saying one of my pet peeves, and that's the word indigenous. And um, I don't really like uh, those catch-all terms because it doesn't require people to get um, uh, distinctions based in who they're talking about. And this is especially for First Nations where there's so many different kinds of First Nations. Um, uh, distinctions based is required. I know in Saskatchewan that if we went down to um, uh, a public place and surveyed people and said, what does Indigenous mean? I, I think nine out of 10 people would say First Nations. So they forget about the Inuit and they forget about the Métis. And uh, we get memos that say, we'd like to in invite Indigenous and Métis people. And for us, that's like saying we would like to invite humans and women. We are already part of the first group that you're talking about. So. Uh, um, I'm encouraging our staff to, when they have to use the word Indigenous, to put a comma there and then put the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations peoples of Canada, comma, and then keep going. Because we're in a, uh, all of this terminology becomes very confusing because it, it uh, changes rather rapidly. And uh, Marcy is how we say thank you in Michif, which is our Indigenous language, and we're working very hard to preserve that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. And uh, you just give me the opportunity to open a new uh, uh, thematic. We are in the year of the uh, uh, indigenous languages. And uh, so uh, uh, maybe you can uh, uh, tell us what are the action, the, uh, your associations or archives or libraries can take to, uh, to help to preserve, to develop uh, the uh, uh, ancestral language of the nation? Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, have attacked. Um, at, at that time, we always prioritize Inuktitut before anything else. Since at least 98% of the population of Nunavut speaks Inuktitut, obviously, each community has different accents in, in the same way that someone in Montreal doesn't have the same French accent as someone from the Madeleine Islands. It's uh, the same Nunavut. Inuktitut is quite different from one community to another. Each time that we publish something uh, about an event concerning Inuits, we'll always uh, prioritize Inuktitut. There are many Inuits who speak uh, Inuktitut at Vatak. Uh, we have Torquitamak. Each, and each month, we promote an artist creating an Inuktitut. But I believe that we that you have the booklet of songs. At the attack, we prepared a booklet of uh, popular songs of Nunavut uh, from the 1980s on. So you have the speak and syllabic. And in uh, Roman writing, and these are popular songs made by uh, Inuits and Nunavut of all types, pop, indie. We have many projects of, like this one. And we're constantly prioritizing Inuit before English or French. The language Michif is uh, critically endangered and uh, according to um, UNESCO this means that um, the speakers are very elderly, they're 65 to 85, they're few and far between because of the Métis dispersal that occurred. Their children and grandchildren do not speak the language and they have very little opportunity to speak to one another and there's very rare instances where they are also married, married to a Michif speaker to have someone to speak the language to. 
for the last 15 years, we've been ensuring that all our children's books are dual type translation in English and Michif, and they come uh, with an audio uh, CD so that people can hear the language. It's an oral language, so it, it, the orthography is just in the establishing phase, and we um, are trying to be consistent with that. And then the other thing that we're doing is called language banking, where we um, record and videotape. Um, el they're all elders now because of the age. Elders uh, who are Michif speakers, I'm uh, using the language because um, they're rapidly passing away. It's a really sad state of Michif right now. We also have developed two, two Michif apps because we recognize different versions of our language. And um, they're uh, free apps uh, from Google Play and um, the, other, the other place to get them. And um, then they, we also have online dictionaries that have audio component, and each one has uh, 10,000 words, and there's also another side of it that's phrases. If you could add something about Avatak. Now, about Inuktitut, obviously we have a translation department, which allows us to keep the idea of translating and also distribute material in Inuit language and broadcast in Inuit language. It's a constant uh, concern. We want to ensure the presence of the Inuit language because it's important because of the language is being eroded. Uh, some statistics said it'll be above 90 percent, but now it's dropping, especially amongst the youth. Even if uh, education up until year three of grade school is still in Inuit, because there are some, we still have some constant efforts to deploy. So in everything we do have attack, it's quite important to make things accessible in Inuit. And we do this uh, at all levels. Thank you. Speaking of Avatak, something was mentioned and which reminded me what I should have done from the beginning. And that it's following uh, an important territorial claim. There was a big fight uh, waged by people who today are historical elders to get some territorial uh, claims recognized, to get the uh, territorial rights of uh, in which and that led to the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, which allowed the attack to exist and to have the means they have available now. So it's a good opportunity. Well, yes and no. I have a correction to make. Yeah, culture was the one which was forgotten in the James Bay Agreement. And when we reread it, well, we understand that no, Avatak is an organization which is really came out of a strong will of the of the Nunavit, Nunavit elders to have an independent organization which would protect and highlight their language and culture and their traditions. So it's about the laws. Well, let's say that the framework which was established at the time did help. Well, it, it facilitated some things, obviously, but still, there were no disposition, no money set aside for culture in the James Bay Agreement. Uh, Vivian, uh, as Vivian said, it, it was a meetings of elders which led them to federate. Yes, okay, that's a lesson to learn for the territorial claims of other nations, right? Culture. No. I would like to remind you that we are non-ceded uh, Mohawk uh, land and uh, salute the Mohawk nation, which has preserved the great Edo-Toshuni tradition in this, on this territory. And now it's up to you and the audience. From the public, this, we are listening to you. Miss 
you know, all the, 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 the main principles of when you want to work with uh, First Nation, Miti and Inuit to promote the culture. I uh, was wondering if you had any particular experience where you saw that, it act that there were specific things that were done that actually worked um, and that went above and beyond uh, what was mentioned, but specific things that you see in your experience. And the same thing, uh, Monsieur, um, Monsieur Gagnon. And Mr. Gagnon, Ms. Bonte talked of her experience with Avatac. What may, made this partnership function well? I meant to say this in my presentation too, but I forgot. Uh, don't bring people in at the 11th hour because it's if it's already planned out and you have an agenda of how you see it going, um, you're just patronizing them. It, it has to be co-developed. I think the people in the first panel said uh, that was important as well. So um, the co-development the co uh, right from the get-go process is very important. The other one is, um, you can build the relationship around some um, non-controversial, non-threatening things first, like maybe you would have um, uh, just some kind of event that, that in, included some refreshments. We eat at everything, so um, it's, it, everybody can break bread together from any cultural group and uh, don't have it be so controversial and then uh, uh, find out who your allies are and, and uh, you'll succeed. How can I answer? It's fairly complex. In history, the history of Avatak, we have all type, we had all types of cooperation uh, between nations with the Crees. I met uh, Cree groups many, many times, me and my colleagues, to pool these various experiences of archive creation and to see exactly how we could develop an arts department, which became an, an arts secretariat. And then we had this special opportunity of establishing a partnership with the MBA of Montreal. Well, there was a, a background to it. It's been more than 15 years, and I forget some of these years now, that I've been working closely with the uh, museum, if only to identify some in with uh, art which would be forgotten otherwise. It's often difficult to read properly, to recognize properly the works of Inuit artists. Since it's my specialty, well, I, I, I was able to work with the museum. So it was, it's a bit of a surprise to see that this major institution wants to tr get so close to our communities. And they say there's a possible partnership which will benefit both. For Avatac, it's a way of uh, opening the, this world to the Edwin to Nunavit, to opening, open them to the world of the Montreal Museum. And for Avatak, it's also a chance to say, well, these archives that we have, it could benefit the communities in the South as much as the Nunavit Inuits. So with this parameter, let's not forget the universities. We have a very uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic milieu we hope to join. And it's part of our attack dream to become this cultural embassy. I think it's probably the role that you also see in your own center. It's important to federate our forces. And for Avatak, and it's practically a message from our archivist who says, Louis, I'm so happy we can have we can cooperate with various institutions where we can borrow documents, where we can have copies of documents. We don't always need the original. Where we can have copies of photographies which uh, feed our database and which will allow us a better knowledge, a better sharing. And that's what I was going to mention in the case of Kujwa Rapik, to give them access to part of an history which is practically unknown to them. We've seen people stand up and say, yes, that's it. We want to know more. It's what we want to, to create as a reflex. And it's uh, the dynamic coming out uh, between, uh, from this meeting between us and the museum. 
We've also talked of reconciliation as being a long process. Indeed, it's not something which is going to happen overnight. But I note that often uh, museums and libraries and so on are very prestigious institutions, and there's great historical trauma amongst First Nations, and that's uh, that it, they were set aside from the cultural development of the mainstream and of our country. Even leaders tend to neglect it because it was it's so ingrained that culture was something secondary, especially our cultures, uh, that our native cultures were something not worth much. So it's important to be to find places which will uh, recognize the value of uh, native cultures. And I'd like to thank the Grand Bibliothèque, which is, for example, has hosted uh, Présence Autochtone, the Présence Autochtone Festival, with many projects. Jean Leroy, the CEO, uh, agreed to the last festival here, where we opened this uh, meeting officially. And I must say that these are important gestures uh, made by a very major institution, a uh, very uh, much archivistic and cultural institution. And that counts a lot to establish a climate of cooperation. Other questions or comments? Where can we find uh, those works? Uh, books and works. Yeah. Uh, so On the website of Avatak, there's a micro site that's called Nunavik Publications, and there you'll find all kinds of books, children books, in French or in English, and uh, you have uh, the uh, object and then the words, for instance, and we also developed uh, children books with uh, vocabulary in Inuktitut. Also, we had uh, works about the Hudson's Bay Company, all kinds of topics, <laughs> even the medicinal plants. So, nunavitpublications.com, I guess. So, Nunavit Publications, that's the key word. Thank you. Thank you very much, our panel. A common point with the previous panel in the sense that you have to take risk, you have to think of collaborating, and you have to look at it in different ways. So, thank you very much. It's now time for lunch. <laughs> so I would just like to remind people that uh, those who will uh, take the, uh, tour, the uh, guided tour of the uh, Grand Bibliothèque, it's at 115 in front of the shop. And uh, otherwise, you can visit the kiosks uh, and the exhibition. And we will sign the protocol of agreement between the BNQ and Library and Archives Canada at uh, 2.15.